most original talk radio station anywhere. We are L.A. Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Fouché Way with Brandon Fouché right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Well, hello and welcome to the Fouché Way radio show. Live every Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m., sponsored by the nonprofit organization called Canine Hope for Improvement Program, where we hope to improve the quality of our dogs' lives by moving towards a no kill society. The number here is 818 602 4929. Well, here we are again another Thursday. I'm very happy to be here. I want to direct everyone to go to the Facebook. Uh, There's an article that we wanted to put up. It's about um, fear. It's about dominance. It's about Brandon, a speaking dog. And it's an article that was put out by Jody Carson. And uh, I really like the article because it tells it exactly like it is. And I would love for those people that are going through difficulties with their dogs and thinking about fear and uh, what it's like to work with dogs and you know those who are interested in how I got started and and those who are just starting out that may be going through some of the similar things uh, read that article it's a, came out of swoop magazine and I think you'll find it uh, very interesting and with that being said I'd like to go with our first client and um, his name is Mike Campbell, and Mike has a dog that the name is Buster Brown. Uh, Hi, Mike. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? All right. Now, I'm really excited to talk to you, Mike, because I I hope there are a lot of listeners out there listening that uh, have found themselves trapped in this way of thinking, not knowing how to get out of it. And, And what I mean by that is, you know, the world is really centered around positive reinforcement. And there's really nothing wrong with it, but it's the how we do it, why we do it, when we do it, where we do it. You know, the real reasons uh, can give positive reinforcement, in my book, a bad name. And I want to talk about this dog that you adopted. It's a little Boston Terrier, very cute, cute dog. And I want you to tell our listeners how this dog has been living with you and how you felt when you brought this dog home. You're married. I want to know about what your wife has been doing. I want to hear about all of the things because because you you actually represent all of the things that people talk about. And can you can you tell our listeners about that? Sure. Well, he's a nice little guy, a uh, uh, Boston. Uh, uh, terrier, mm-hmm. and he is our third Boston Terrier, fourth Boston Terrier, and um, and our second rescue. Mm-hmm. Now, when we got him home, very well behaved. He didn't jump up on people. He 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 think he was bonded almost immediately to us, and my wife particularly. He jumped up on her lap and wouldn't leave it for until we had to drag him out of the car. <laughs> Well, who doesn't and, like that? And he just, you know, typical Boston Terrier behavior. He he was a loving, uh, kind, gentle. He, my wife hand feeds him. Uh-huh. And he does not nip or anything. He merely removes it from your fingertip. Mm-hmm. He is absolutely gentle. Mm-hmm. Uh, we take we bought him home, and he, he just was just fit right in, and uh, he ran around the house a couple times, and but the first thing my wife did was uh, start cooking a steak for him for his uh, welcome home meal. <laughs> and she did. She cooked him a, a better steak than I got that night. <laughs> and that little sucker uh, uh, just was right next to her and then next to me and then next to her. <laughs> he works her with his eyes. He has one blue eye. He works her with his eyes so hard that he should be a professional. <laughs> That's right. And you know, I forgot, we got to put a picture up of him on Facebook, and I will make sure that we do that. Edgar. Okay, and, go on. Uh, he is, he is, well, frankly, he, he just bonded to us so strongly that uh, as far as my wife and I are concerned, uh, the son 
rises and sets on and nothing but nothing but uh, sunshine comes out of it. <laughs> and that's pretty much the way we felt until started to uh, become aggressive with other dogs. Now, we have many neighbors with other dogs who would like to come over and visit. Uh-huh. And uh, the first thing he did, he charges the gate and just starts barking and howling and and being pretty bad. Right. And tried a couple things, and I even went so far as to buy a shock collar, but I just couldn't get myself to rest <laughs> around that one. Well, thank you. <laughs> And uh, I, my wife was was terribly concerned, uh, thinking that maybe he was psychologically damaged right. and beyond uh, keeping. Uh-huh. And we were absolutely going to. Uh, she wanted me to return him right then and there, and uh-huh. I refused. Uh huh. And he um, actually, what brought it all to a head is he. I went to the front door when somebody rang the doorbell, and he he uh, flipped through the door. And it was my neighbor, Pam, with her Highland Terrier, who outweighs him by 10 pounds, <laughs> and is, is, is a lot rougher dog. Right. And uh, he just went at that at that Archie, who, who has never really been attacked that I can know of. Uh-huh. And he just rolled him over and was right at him. And uh, all the neighbors came running out to hear the commotion, and finally we dragged Buster off of uh, Archie. Uh-huh. And it was one hell of a deal. We even called a vet uh-huh. to take a look at Archie. And Buster was the one that came out on the short end of that stick. <laughs> but they're, they're just afraid of that little howler. Uh-huh. So that's when I ended up calling you and saying, gosh done it, Brandon. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Ray, uh, Rachel Farmer over at Boston Buddies where I got him. Yeah, I got a text from her. I got a text from her, yeah. And get him squared away because uh, she insisted that you could with a solution to the problem. Uh-huh. And that's when I called you. Uh, we came down on a Saturday at nine o'clock, and we went through our routine that you and I did uh-huh. with him uh, and getting his attention, and then talking about all the things that I were was not doing right, like just sitting there and idly petting him and rewarding him for whatever little thought was going through his head. <laughs> that's right. And that's exactly what I do. When I'm nervous, I reach down and start petting him and making him feel good because it makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that's, that's why a lot of us have dogs. Right, of know? course, of course. I've had a dog, all, I'm 68 years old, I've had a dog all my life from uh, 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 Black Lab Retrievers, which we used to go hunting with. Uh-huh. Poodles, uh, even had one chihuahua when I was in the service. Okay. And this is the first time I ever had a dog that I could not get a grip on. Yeah, a little guy. Little guy. A little Yeah, he's, he weighed 19 pounds when we brought him home. He's up to 23 now. <laughs> yeah, he's, he looks good, though, man. He has no failure to thrive at our house. <laughs> He is, he, he is a solid little bit of, of muscle. Right. But he's a, and he's just happy as a clam. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, he's just came into the room with me and it just laid down on my feet. Yeah, I can uh, tell he's really bonded with, with you. I haven't seen him with your wife, but I know this little guy yeah, is really bonded. Him, he knows where the food comes from. <laughs> he is not stupid. He is <laughs> not slow. He is, he is nothing. He is just the brightest little guy. And uh, easily trained. My wife has just taught him to do a couple little tricks, nothing right. special. Uh huh. But he, when I call him, he he knows his name. When I call him, he comes. Right. When my wife calls him, and tells him there's food, he comes. He knows what's going on. Right. And you you know what's interesting about that? When the aggression kicks out, and then your wife yeah, says, just, your wife I'm, says, I think he's damaged. No, this little guy is very smart. He knows exactly yeah. what he's doing. Damaged. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Because he just, he had one type of behavior as soon as he saw a dog. Right. And that was scary. Right. He, I mean, he just, all of his muscle and all of his might, just, and we cannot, you, you just can't have that kind of, of activity. Yeah. That's just not going to happen. Well, you know, it's called ownership. I mean, when you own something, you tell someone when they can play with it and when they can't, 
And you guys absolutely were, to him, the juicy bone that he did not want to share with any other dog. And that's true. That's absolutely true. <laughs> and, and there's no doubt in my mind that, that uh, he was just uh, well, selfish as hell about the whole thing. Uh-huh. And I don't think it was territorial and prerogative or, or territorial uh, greediness uh-huh. so much as it was. He was, and, and uh, yeah, I thought about it when we had our conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he is what I would think what you were describing a beta. Mm-hmm. He's a dog that wants to be an alpha. <laughs> he wants to be a pack leader. But he can't be the pack leader. <laughs> there we go. He can't be. He because you know it's it's the two legged people that are the pack leaders in this group. And you know what's and interesting? He wanted to be. He just in lieu of of um, a pack leader, he was going to take over. Yeah, he's going to he take over. He wanted all the other four wheel dogs to know that he was the pack leader. <laughs> Actually, most of the humans. Right. And, and uh, my son, a lot of people would come to the gate, and I introduced him. And he was he was fine, uh-huh. but dogs not even a little bit. He mm-hmm. he get a whiff of a dog and just go into his routine. Right, right, exactly. And now, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the poor girls whose uh, Highland Terrier Buster tried to rearrange uh-huh. um, came over the other day, and she was on her way to work, and so she didn't have her dog. But she she walks wide around Buster. And I said, <laughs> no, no, do this. Come right up here. Right. And, Say hello to Buster. Let me introduce you. Right. And he sidestepped timidly to the to the front gate there, mm-hmm. um, in our, of our little patio, and uh, Buster sat right next to me. Mm-hmm. He didn't move. Right. Just sat there like he was supposed to. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Go talk to go go uh, uh, go to Pam." And he looked at me and I said, "Go to Pam." And he did. He went right over to the lady. Mm-hmm. Yes, at her a couple times, and then. Turned around and came back to me totally indifferent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He had nothing more to, 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 as far as he was concerned, he was done. Uh, she, he knows, uh, she knows, he knows who she is, and he's, he, he was done introducing. <laughs> and, and that was, it was just kind of funny in a way that how he did that. And now Pam has come by another time, uh, actually yesterday afternoon, and he just looks at her. Uh, I tell her to go over there and sniff, to, to say hello. And he goes over, takes two seconds of a sniff, and then comes back. Mm-hmm. Uh, just indifferent as the devil to, um, to everybody now. Yeah. But, you know, when you came, I, I want to jump back first. Uh, when you first came to get him, you know, I always try to talk to people about discipline and domination and hierarchy and leadership and all of that. And And just the way you're speaking now, you were very adamant about the fact that You've read books, you knew this, you knew that, you understand pack mentality, blah, blah, blah. I said, you go, man. You, I've, you got I've it. I've been around dogs all my life. I yeah. got a trainer or a behavioralist, mm-hmm. but never went across the dog yet that I didn't have a grip on. Mm-hmm. And, and so, this is the fun that stumped me. I could <laughs> not master his behavior. Right. So how quickly, we have to tell our audience, you know, that's listening, because... You know, this whole show is about saving lives, and, you know, we got to be working really quick to accomplish that, because actually, you know, dogs are dying as we speak. Oh, and, absolutely. And I and, want uh, you to say, I mean, how long did this take you at my um, point? I think I was at your facility about an hour and a half, mm-hmm. and uh, that's as long as it took. Now, you know, being aware that he was, he had previously been exposed to you. Right, you, exactly. You were not a commodity, mm-hmm. uh, and he was acting up right there at your front door. Mm-hmm. Um, matter of fact, uh, a look-alike pit bull mm-hmm. had him by three times the weight <laughs> right. and was being very nice, very well-behaved, and Buster decided that now was the time to exert his dominance. Right. And the poor pit bull looked at him like, "You're not lunch, buddy." <laughs> and uh, your your associate uh, took care of the uh, pit bull, and right. uh, and I'm I'm going there and said, "Jesus, you're not smart." Uh-huh. And I was concerned he's going to someday take on the wrong dog. Uh huh. And that was that. That's a big concern. You mm-hmm. know, it, I'm I was not. My wife wanted me to get rid of that puppy too, and that was the sh- that was what was really driving me. I I didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I I liked that little guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 
it didn't take any long. It didn't take very long at all. Actually, he, you know, I think we spent 20, 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, mm-hmm. uh, ex- exerting a dominance when you walked him the first time mm-hmm. up the street and back. And at that point, he learned where, he, I think he remembered where he was supposed to be doing. Right. <laughs> point on, it was all a downhill roll. And then the most telling thing, of course, was when you put him in the dog run with those 10 or 12 other little dogs, or little dogs, they're not really right. little, fish bulldog, a couple Boston Terriers, um, uh, English or uh, Australian Sheepdog. There was a couple of different breeds in right. And I just knew that there was going to be nothing but fur flying. <laughs> Not the case. Uh, when he went in there, he uh, sniffed, rolled, sniffed, and rolled, and that was it. He was... He'd already ex- accepted his not the pack leader role, and then started to blend. Right. So what this and tells you is that you know this is you and I talked about yeah. forty five minutes after the fact <laughs> while he wandered around under uh, by us and sat underneath me. Right. And it, I can always tell when he's when he's trying to suck up, he always sits underneath me. <laughs> yeah. And so now you know this guy was pulling you all around town. Oh, yeah, you, you walk down the sidewalk, and now the, he had to stop at every tree and right. sniff and every tree. Right. Every bush. And now, not, no, heck, uh, this afternoon or this morning, um, we went for our little walk down uh, down the street a bit mm-hmm. and back, and no hunting, no pecking, no peeing, no nothing. No nothing, right. And then the next step now, we're going we're gonna to get him with the dogs. I mean, you saw, we brought a dog out. We walked him past that dog. You yeah, yeah, that's, the problem right now is getting him relaxed, doing what he's supposed to be doing. Also, getting all the other dogs that he's pissed off to come around. Right, yeah. And, and this is, I'm glad you said that because that reminds me. Uh, we're trying to put together a handout for people in introducing dogs and taking dogs home and what to do within the first week or the second week. And uh, that's one of the criteria when you're bringing a new dog home. And, and we'll get deeper into that about what to have there when that new dog actually appears in his home and how to integrate him into his environment. Because that's something that's never talked about. I've never really talked about it, although it's just something that I do every day. And, and that's where you're having this problem. And we're going to have to fix that. And we will fix that. But I just wanted to have you on. So that, you know, you can see and tell the people how quickly. I mean, this guy is not stupid. It was a light switch. Yeah. It was a light switch. Exactly. I've had switch, light switches give me more trouble. Than <laughs> you, get one. Well, you know what he did? But Leroy says he switched it on you. He just, he just, he just turned. He just he came right to it. Uh, once he, once you established the uh, pack leader. Thing on uh, the pack leader uh, uh, position right. by walking him down the street and making him uh, stay to your rear, right? On this to your rear in that in that uh, follower position, mm-hmm. uh, that was pretty much it. Yeah, the psychology is tremendous, but you got to understand it. It's not really something that I talk to people about that I haven't evaluated their dog with. A lot of people say, well, just tell me, tell me, tell me. But, I mean, you were there. I mean, is that something that you have to be there, or, or could I just tell you over the phone? Oh, no. I, I, I actually had to see it. Yeah, uh, there and we it's go. Not that, it's not even a matter of credibility mm-hmm. so much as it is I did. I would not have understood what you were talking about. Right. And, and actually, I would have doubted you a little bit. Yeah. Again, I've taken, I, I trained the, the, the two Labrador retrievers to go hunting and throwing out the decoy and throwing up. Mm-hmm. And, and getting to go out into the water and, and bringing a, 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 a not a duck, a, a, a pigeon's back. Right. And you know when we, when we were hunting in El Centro, and that was a bit of training. You'd throw the you'd throw that uh, the bird target and mm-hmm. throw it into the pool, and they'd go jump in the pool and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. This guy was so much. It was so simple, much so much simpler, but so much more difficult. Yeah, and you know I always say dogs are simple-minded creatures. Right, able to perform complex tasks. Absolutely. And, and that's what you were dealing with. I, I, I was dealing with pulling my hair out because there was just no reason for it. Mm-hmm. He, he did not exhibit any kind of aggressive uh, personality traits mm-hmm. until he saw another dog. Right. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you. It's just as quick as it was when you were at my place, even if I got to come out to you and get that done for you, because that's the only missing equation. We just know he's got you on redial, man. He's got your number on redial, but now he knows there's a new sheriff in town. Yeah, and, as soon as we got out of the car coming back that Saturday, yeah. he, he did the dance on me, you know, hunting and pecking and right. hunting and pecking. <laughs> you and, straightened him out real quick. And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I had my hands full. Yeah. So, <laughs> 20 minutes after we got home, we went for that walk. Yeah. And he, he just took off. And I had rigged up a two leash leash. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not one leash. And, uh, and, and I had a plastic shovel in lieu of the chuck it and, uh, uh, <laughs> used, and, and used it to intimidate him and as soon as he saw it flash in mm-hmm. front of his face yeah and to the ground he backed up and just all of a sudden looked at me like what mm-hmm. and became quite a bit more docile yeah quite a and i believe that that's pretty much the whole deal that's the whole he, deal and you know, Mike, I, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to your wife, and I'm sure it would have been interested to hear her side of the story, but we're always running short on time. Always. I, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for holding on to, um, well, his name was Edgar, but uh, Buster Brown now, and, yeah. and coming to me and getting this bit of information that's going to give him a great life for the rest of his life. And, oh, absolutely. And, and it, it was just imperative. It was, it was so imperative that we get a grip on him in this manner. Mm-hmm. And I just thought I was doing everything right, and I could not understand where he had gone wrong. Because right. it wasn't my fault. Right. Not yeah. my, I didn't do it. Not my fault. <laughs> well, it, that sure in the hell was. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted our people to hear. I mean, it's got to come from you guys. you got to realize the error of your ways and get it together. And when you do, man, nobody can change your mind. No one can steer you again in the wrong direction. No, it, and it's not the size of the dog or the ferocity of the dog. Right. It, it's the personality, and and you know, he's so focused about mm-hmm. wanting to get onto another dog right. for that, at that time that you could have sprayed him with a garden hose. Right. All it would have done was made him wet. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, Mike, Mike Campbell, thank you, man. And uh, we'll be talking. I want to keep in touch with you. Tell your sure. wife I say hello and a Buster Brown. Give him a hug for me and uh, let's talk again. Okay. All righty. All right. Great. I'll, Thank you. I'll. Well, uh, we've got another guest coming up. Um, Tommy is going to be talking about his dog, Meyerhofer. Tommy Meyerhofer. But first, I want to say some things about our, our first caller here, and uh, hopefully, we'll have enough time. Uh, for me to finish here, but I definitely want to get to Tommy. You know, when one experiences a bad dog fight and is touched by that emotion, things change, and the idea of having a dog loses its enchantment. Life changes as we know it, and until someone can bring meaning back into our life, we become lost with what to do how to do it, how to start over, how to get back to the way it was. My reason for helping people is to prevent them from experiencing a traumatic experience that will scar them and diminish the quality of life for them and their dog, which generally leads to euthanasia. This is something that I know firsthand. My experience with understanding dogs when I was a young man caused me to jeopardize my life and ended the life of a dog that viciously attacked me. So you see, when, when now I realize that when I look into the eyes of that particular dog, I really was seeing my own emotion reflected back at me. I was not looking at him from his perspective, and so he misinterpreted mine. And we both paid a terrible price, one that I will never forget. But I was able to recover because the fantasy 
that I had about dogs as a kid became a reality when my actions caused the death. You see, the emotional feeling that takes place when you are involved in something like that bonds you to it forever. And obviously, it can take years before you begin to understand the significance of the event. The fear of what took place caused me to pay attention to detail and to question why did this have to happen and know now after all these years the answers are being reflected back at me not from the reason that led me to be bitten but from the fear that produced the need to be cautious has led me to the position and the profession that I am in today. And so, you know, when I think about my mission, it is to teach you to understand this way of thinking so you don't have to follow in my footsteps by making mistakes. I talk about this all the time. The mistakes have already been made. Time and time again, you will hear people say, I didn't realize that I was contributing to the aggression that my dog is displaying by interacting with them the way I do. But I have spent many years speaking and listening to people talk about their problems, about training and and how treats didn't solve it. And it's not that the treats or training is bad, but that the relationship was not built on the proper hierarchy. Therefore, you became a member of the pack rather than a leader. So you were seen as a subordinate to the one who wanted to be in charge, which was your dog. So when you begin to introduce treats from that place that you have placed yourself in, you are rewarding the positioning. And so every time treats are used you are rewarding a particular mindset that was built from the preset positioning and that's why the dog will take a treat and still try and bite the person because you are rewarding the mindset. Now, that was created out of the pack positioning. The fact that the position that the dog feels that he is in is more important than the treat itself, when the treat is introduced, it is a reward because of the position. And when we introduce sit, stay, down within that equation, and at that time, you got to understand, because the dog is simply multitasking. They, They can multitask. Because they are simple-minded creatures that are able to produce complex tasks. And so, we trick ourselves. We trick ourselves into a false sense of security that is not real control from an alpha or nature point of view. Because it does not provoke the right hormone. Nature says sit and down only because you are tired. And stay when you are afraid or apprehensive of something. Try and catch a dog that's running the street that doesn't want to be caught, is afraid of you. He stays away from you. How can you see yourself in a leadership role by doing this type of positioning, sit, stay, come, heal, and then providing a treat? You are just bribing and tricking your way into a position of a false sense of security. That's what you're doing. Because when you tell them to do these things to prevent them from doing something else, you are trying to control behavior with a trick. And if aggression is involved, the hormone is too strong. So you can never be sure that they will comply when you say sit or stay, when the aggression is involved. Now, my purpose for saying all this to you is that I want you to look at nature. Just imagine 
if I, if you could take a, a trip with me on a bird, let's say, and I drop you off in the middle of the Serengeti as a bird and we perched on a tree and we were viewing what was happening in the Serengeti. Believe me, you would never see predators sitting around handing out packs and treats and having everyone sit pretty in a straight line and saying, good girl and good boy. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't happen. There are no kisses on the lips being handed down because they look so cute laying out on the plains of the Serengeti. I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. This comes out of the mind of human beings the way we practice positive re reinforcement. And we end up calling this obedient. I only want you to have an open mind when, I, when I'm talking about these kinds of things. I mean, just smile and laugh at our silliness and, and don't take what we do so serious and make the dog live up to the standard that is unreal and false when he doesn't measure up in this fictitious world. Don't kill him. We made them neurotic. The dog of today are different from the dogs 20, 25 years ago. Today, they are more pets and companions than guard dogs or service dogs. They don't have the same job titles that require protection and guard, guarding of us and our property. If your dog uh, bites someone, man, he can be taken and killed. We don't want guard dogs today. That, that's a problem for them today because... If your dog kills another dog, he can be killed. He can be taken away, quarantined, killed. And these things happen all the time. You know, I, I mean, it can take place. And even if it takes place on your property where you thought you were safe, you're not. And so the dog job title has been diminished to no longer chasing away predators from our property or intruders from our house. They have lost all of their rights that they were created to uphold because now it is our liability if these things occur. We are at fault. And because they have lost those rights, it is up to us to gain the knowledge that will prevent them from being killed. If your dog has a predisposition to be aggressive, don't promote it by bringing out the prey drive with toys and call it a game. It is not a game if he misinterprets our intentions and simply knocks someone over. He can be taken, quarantined, and killed. If we want the dog to change its ways, we must change ours. Don't continue doing the same silly things that make them hyper and assertive that can lead to dominance and aggression. We should understand that giving and tending to the needs can give you and their life a greater purpose. It is not the things that you want them to have that makes them happy. It's what they need. It's just simply being with you. Just like being in a relationship. Just being together. We don't have to really be doing anything when we're happy with each other. That's how it is in the wild. You know, the alpha, <laughs> think about it. It doesn't see a potential pack member in the distance and runs out to greet them bearing gifts saying, Oh my gosh, we've been waiting for you. Come, come see, see who's here. <laughs> I mean... I mean, you know, they, they don't say, hey, would you like something to eat? You know, would you like a little bison, a leg of gazelle, perhaps some wild boar? <laughs> we do that. This type of thing comes out of the thought of human beings, man. <laughs> you can imagine this, you know, the alpha saying, um, are you hungry right now? Okay, you're not hungry? All right, that's okay. Just leave it there. Come back later and eat it whenever you get a chance. No one will bother it. <laughs> Food doesn't lie around in the wild. It doesn't lie around in the wild. Genetically, it just doesn't happen. And when you get back, I could hear them saying, and when you get back, 
if it's dry, I'll put a little warm water on it for you. <laughs> I mean, you know, because daddy loves you. <laughs> Maybe a little gravy or something. To spice it up a bit. <laughs> That's human stuff. You know, I mean, come on, man. I, I gotta laugh. I, you know, I, I laugh sometimes, you know, because in the field of rescue, you do a lot of crying, man. And so you got to find humor and, and, and stick it in, the laughter in, you know, every now and then. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but, you know, if it sounds familiar, take note. Take note. You know, I've got, I, I got a lot of interesting stories. I mean, I, one comes to mind in particular that comes to mind was, you know, the case of the five cans of dog food. And if Leroy is listening, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, we had someone come in and they loved their dog and they said, look, I've got these five cans of gourmet dog food, Leroy. And I want you to go back there and get five bowls, open them all up, pour them in the bowl, and let him decide which one he likes the best. <laughs> now, <laughs> now Leroy, you know, he's a very polite guy. You know, he's very politically correct. And uh, he said the right thing. He said, yes, sir, I'll be right back. He came to me and told me the story. I looked at him. About a minute or so. And I said, handle your business. <laughs> do what you got to do, man. You know? <laughs> you, know I, you know, I get it. I understand. You know, I always talk about humanizing. We're human. And we're going to humanize them. And really, even though I, I'm laughing at this, I, I really don't have a problem with it. Really. It's just that if you can't control your dog, then you've got to look at what you're doing. If you don't have a problem with aggression or a problem with your dog that can lead to harm of you or another person, then these things are fine. You know, they're cute. The reality is we are screwing our dogs up if we don't do the balancing work. So that means... You can do all of the positive reinforcement, the love and affection, and all the silly things that make us feel good. You can do that, but you must do the balance work. You must do the discipline and domination. We must talk to the genetic code of the dog first before domestication. I'm going to say it again. We must talk first to the genetic code of the dog before domestication. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you can sleep with your dog. You can kiss him in the mouth. <laughs> I mean, you know, whatever wags your tail, man. I mean, you can do it. But you got to do it, people. You can no longer be led in the wrong direction. If you're going to be successful with this. So, so don't let anybody sell you a wolf ticket. If you want to buy a wolf ticket, man, buy it for me. You know, buy it for the next seminar. Let me speak to you in the language of dogs. I mean, you can just call me the dog woofer because I will be howling this information every Thursday until we get bored or tired or decide to do something else. I mean... This is a nonprofit organization, CHIP, Canine Hope for Improvement. You know, we want to help dogs. We have a race that's coming up, Reason to Race, uh, a gentleman that's running, and um, we want to sponsor, we want to help him. We want to give donations. I mean, he's running for CHIP, Canine Hope for Improvement Program. Check the Facebook out and, uh, and look at this gentleman. You know, he loves pit bulls. And so with that, I want to go into my next caller, Tommy, Tommy Meyerhofer. Did I say that right, Tommy? Very good. Yeah, <laughs> hey, I'm man. No one can pronounce ever. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's, some, it's my last name. No one can ever pronounce it. You did a very good job. All right. Well, thank you, man. 
that bothered me for first. I'm like, wait a minute, let me get this right. Uh, look, you've come a long way, man. Yes. Tell the yes, people where you've come from. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. Eh? Right, Washington, D.C. And you just got in here yesterday. And yes. uh, you have been on the Facebook. You have uh, been inserting and making yourself a part of the team. And I want, before we get into the problem, I want to tell people how you, because I think it's an interesting story, how you actually came about finding us here in Los Angeles, the Fouché Way, and the team that you have now contacted. Tell us tell us about it. Well, uh, I have two dogs. Uh, I have one, Roxy. She's, she'll be 14 in uh, February, and she's in amazing shape, I think, and you mm-hmm. know, still runs around and everything. Uh, a few years ago, when I was living in Orlando, Florida, I found this little blue pit bull on the side of the road who was missing fur, and he's all skinny and dirty, and mm-hmm. No one knew who we, who we belonged to, and I said, oh, all right, come home with me. <laughs> uh, wasn't really the time I was planning to get a pit bull. I was figuring later on in life I would get one. But um, So, you know, we did the, the the kind of police dog training in the beginning because he, he was little. He had some quirks about him. And he was a little aggressive in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, we moved back to D.C., and I found a trainer because he just liked to pull, pull me the whole time and found a trainer. And I was just like, this is, is getting better, but it's just not right. There's just something missing. And mm-hmm. so one night I was, I was home when I was, I was bored and I went to YouTube and I was like, I feel like learning something. So I typed in documentaries and a bunch of boring science documentaries came up and I was like, eh, this isn't doing it for me. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, I love, I love people. So See if there's any pit bull documentaries, and mm-hmm. I started, started watching this pit bull documentary, and within ten minutes, there's this there's this guy on there who was saying stuff like, "We look at the the way nature has designed the dog, and we respect it." And mm-hmm. I was like, "Wait, wait a minute!" Mm-hmm. That, that kind of hit something in me, and you know, saying things like, "They can't be something they're not. If, if the food's good, they eat it. If not, they go away." Oh, oh something interests them. Yeah, I know what you're forward, talking. They go back, and yeah, so yeah. I'm like, "This guy's." He knows what he's talking about, so mm. tracked you down on Facebook and uh, sent you a message, and he said, "Yeah, let's start saving some dogs' lives." And I was like, "That's what I want to do." So that's how I found you. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I don't know how many people have seen that segment on pit bulls. Um, it's very interesting. I would like to get a piece of that footage off of there um, because there is a uh, there's a segment where I have about 30 pit bulls in a narrow hallway. Do you remember seeing that? Yes. Yes, and that was what impressed me because I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, those are big that boys too, man. They're big boys. And, and um, you know, I heard people say, oh, that's not possible, you know. And I say, yeah, it's possible. And the reason that they say it's not possible is because the pit bull generally is not a pack animal. It was not created to be a pack animal, Okay. And so that's why people don't believe in that. But I say, no, no, no. It's an animal first. Okay? And and then the type of animal that it is and what it's bred for, and then we can go on and on and on, but it can be done if you can control them hormonally. Uh, and I'm sorry. I just, want, I just wanted to say that because I didn't know that's how you found me. So uh, I've been thinking about that. So you called. Uh, we talked. Um You've been talking to people on the Facebook. You've been trying to insert and be a part of this thing. And I believe I talked to you once over the phone. We haven't really had a, a full consultation. I just talked to you about what was going on with your dog. And and I think this is very interesting. Can you tell our listeners about that? What's your problems that you're having? Um, my, it was basically my pit bull. He's, you know, he's a super friendly dog. In the beginning, he had some dog aggression, so I still get a little nervous when he sees a dog his size or bigger. He gets a little, he kind of gets that look in his eye and uh, makes me a little nervous. But for the most part, he's, he's very friendly with dogs, but he just will pull and mark and then kick up grass all the time. So, and, you know, I started getting tendonitis in my left knee because it was just hard trying to, like, hold him back. Like, no, we're going this way and mm-hmm. not pulling. Get behind me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, we tried prong collars and that just, you know, made my shoulder hurt. And mm-hmm. I-, I could never really just give it to him like like the, the trainers would say to do. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you mean the actual so, physical part? 
Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, call like that all... Make them yelp, and I'm like, that doesn't yeah. feel good. To all me. stick and no <laughs> carrot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and at the same time, I'd also that other trainers are like, tell me, he's like, good boy, good boy. And I'm like, this just gets him excited. I don't <laughs> right. I don't get it. And, and then we, we also did, you know, stuff where one trainer told me I made him too calm and told me to start doing tug and bite work with him, mm-hmm. and, and that just made him pay even less attention to me when something more interesting like a squirrel ran by. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got you on the phone, kind of told you what was going on. He kind of gave me a, a little blueprint of what to do. Um, I did it that night, and my tendonitis in my left knee is almost cleared up now because <laughs> he's walking behind me. And it's so I, I've been taking him for, like, longer walks. Right. Because it's funny because you say, you know, if you walk your dog or you run your dog, try and wear him out, you just make a better athlete. And, mm-hmm. and like, that's sort of what I was doing because we'd walk for a long time just so I could get some peace and quiet without him giving me that sigh and looking at me like, I'm so bored. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so um, sometimes I end up just walking him longer just because I'm enjoying it so much, I kind of lose track of time. And wow. um, it's just really great. And he just comes home and lays down, and that's about it. And it's, it's so much more relaxing now. You know, I love this story, uh, Tommy, because, you know, you tried to play tug of war with your dog. You did the agility. Um you know, I remember when I asked you, why did you want a, the dog to walk behind you, you know, and and why was there a problem with him pulling? And and I told you, I said, he's hunting. Do you remember that? Yes. I said, he's hunting. And what you've been doing is rewarding the hunt. Yeah. Which is what a lot of people do. They go on this very terrible walk. That last for I don't know however long you you know until you just kind of give up, and then you come back, and you take the collar and the leash off the dog. Stop me if I'm wrong, and we say good boy, and we go feed him or we give him a treat as though you just had a wonderful time, yep. knowing that it was terrible, and so we end up rewarding the action. Yeah. And then we think that this is what I'm supposed to do because we just actually went out on a hunt. You know, we're trying to, you know, look at it in terms of nature. We're out on a hunt and then he comes back and he grabs the food and he eats it and that's the kill, right? And that's one of the best things about you is sometimes I would say something and then it would just kind of hit me about how absurd it was what I just said. Like, well, like, <laughs> well we'd go for a walk, both dogs and... You know, it'd be fun, and, you know, we were walking like a pack, and and then we'd come home, and then we would eat as if we had just, like, done a kill, and, <laughs> you know, that's kind of what a pack does, right? And as soon as I said that, I was like, oh, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> right. And, you know, this whole thing is so elusive. It's so mystical because the physical thing is never consummated. I mean, they never grab something, shake it, kill it, eat it. But everything that we do up until that point produces the hormone that says this is what we're getting ready to do. It's like the person that chews gum, getting the stomach ready for something that is not going to receive, but you're producing all of the hormones. And You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then the dog begins to become neurotic and stress. That stress leads to aggression because it says, I've had this feeling inside of me. I'm here, damn it. What are we going to do? When are we going to actually allow for me to emotionally, hormonally, uh, physically experience this thing that you've been teasing me with? Yeah. <laughs> it's like going on a first date. You, you know, you just kiss. You're like, we've been doing this for a year. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> has got it it's, it's funny because like I I I feel bad for you in a way is because like just a little bit that I know you know the whole you can't keep it if you don't give it away thing. right like, my friend my friend posted on Facebook oh our new dog I took her to the dog park yesterday and threw the ball for her for three hours and then she wouldn't give me the tennis ball it's so cute and I was like whoa <laughs> you know what you're doing right that's spray drive and and you're and they're just like she's the sweetest dog ever. You haven't met her yet. Like, that's, that's not what I'm saying. And right, right. I'm exactly. Like, you're also teaching her to go away towards the stimulus away from you. Right. <laughs> like, 
it's yeah, hard. We, I'm like, oh, I think man, we need to, to yeah, we got to really be taught what this leadership and alpha really looks like from a concrete position, man. It, yeah. No longer, you know, we, the myth buster, we got to do it. We got to say exactly what it is. And you know what? You can take it or leave it alone, man. You know what I mean? If you're having problems, you need to look at something new, have an open mind. And know that you're doing it for the best interest of the dog, which is going to give your quality of life uh, uh, tenfold, you know? Yeah. And so, my gosh, Tom, we're at the end of the time uh, once again. And I'm so happy that you came out. I'm, I'm glad that we talked. I'd like to thank Mike Campbell also for rescuing and keeping uh, Buster Brown and our listeners for listening. And please, if you have a question, I'd like to start answering those questions. Send it into Facebook. Twitter us. If you're having a good time, if you're getting information, if you're not sure about something, I can't help you if I don't know. You can't keep what you don't give away. So just don't sit back, listen to this, try to grab everything you can and run with it without being a part of this movement. Because that's exactly what this is. This is a movement. And thank you once again for listening to the Fouché Ray Radio Show. We'll see you next Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. You're listening to Fouché Ray with Brandon Fouché. Right here on L.A. Talk Radio.